What I'm going to do tonight, I'm going to give you two tellings of the gospel. Two ways that the gospel is presented. One way we would call the modern way. It's 500 years old. You think that's not modern, Peter? 500 years old is pretty old. Anyway, compared to the other telling, it is quite modern and quite young. Because the other telling of the gospel is probably as old as the oldest church is about 2,000 years old. It was the telling of the gospel the way the Orthodox Church actually told it. Our church fathers told it basically like this. One telling, the modern gospel, I'll call the judicial telling of the gospel. The, how would I call that? The more lawful telling of the gospel. The other telling, the old telling, the ancient or patristic telling of the gospel, I would call the restorative telling of the gospel. Restorative meaning the healing telling of the gospel. In the modern gospel, you'll find that God is portrayed primarily as a judge. In the restorative gospel, the patristic gospel, the gospel that our church fathers actually proclaimed, the gospel is more of a healing nature. In the modern telling of the gospel, and by the way, God is portrayed as the doctor, the physician, the one who performs healings. In the modern telling of the gospel, you'll find that sin is basically the transgression of the law. It's the breaking of the law. And the only remedy for that is punishment. In the old patristic telling of the gospel, sin is basically seen as a fatal terminal disease, which only can be healed. So we have two different ways of seeing that. In the modern gospel, the venue in which this takes place is a courtroom where there is a, joy, a judge, where there are lawyers, where there is a, pers a prosecutor. In the restorative telling of the gospel, the venue is a hospital, is more of a place where people who are ill come to be restored. These are the two ways of telling the gospel. Now, I'm going to try to tell you the first gospel, the modern way of telling the gospel, shortly, so that you will have an idea of what I mean. And I think many of us will recognize elements in that telling. In order to do that, I use two chairs. Let's say a white chair and a black chair. They are light gray, dark gray. But at least they are different chairs. They're just clear. Now, let's start. In the beginning, God, can you all see it? Because the chairs are really important. It's called the gospel in chairs, all right? No, 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 no. That's okay. In the beginning, God created man, after having created everything else, to have fellowship with him, to have communion with him, to be happy together. But the unthinkable happened, and man sinned 
turned away from God. And because God is holy, he cannot look upon sin. And so he had to look away from man and a chasm, a separation started. And man walked away from God. And because God is too holy to actually look upon sinful man, there didn't seem to be much of a solution. Now, God being God, thought, of course, we got to somehow win man back. So after trying for a long time, pursuing man, talking to man, and trying to get things straight, after a long time of all kinds of judgments and difficult things that happened, God finally came as a man on this earth. He sent his son. His son became a man. And his son walked with man on this earth. And so he made it possible for man to relate back again to God. But still, man did not get it. And because God is too holy, couldn't look upon sin, the separation still existed. So, because of this, God, in his love, gave his life to redeem man. Man actually walking away from God, God hanging on the cross. And as he died, that made all the difference. As a matter of fact, God laid the punishment that was due to man on his own son. You could almost say that God killed his own son in order to be able to redeem man from his sin. Of course, that wasn't the last thing that he died. He rose from the dead, and now everyone who turns to him, to God, who believes in him, God then accepts. He becomes a child of God. But if man does not return, does not repent, God, who is too holy to look upon sin, cannot accept man in his sinful condition and turns away from man. This is always a problem. Every time that man turns to God, God will turn to man. But if man turns away from God, God turns away from man. The issue always being sin. There's much more to say about this particular telling. But you and I can both see that this does not really do it. It's wonderful that God would want to give his son to redeem us, but what about the fact that God actually killed his own son, or let's say, put our sin upon him because somehow God needed to be paid for our sin. Someone need, needed to be paid. What about 
the violence that happened at the cross. It's really a telling of the story that is very hard to understand, if you really think about it. It really pits God against Jesus, and it pits God against us, as well as that it pits us against God. It doesn't help. However, many of us, including myself to a certain extent, have heard this gospel preached to us. Basically saying, repent and you will be saved. Which is nothing wrong with that. But if you don't repent, you will get lost. So it was also very conditional. Which is nothing wrong with that either. However, it's maybe not the full beautiful gospel that we read in the gospels, in the tellings. So, let's go to the restorative telling of the gospel. Are you still with me? I need a little bit of water. Because the second part, the restorative telling of the gospel, gets me really excited. Super excited. And I'm not even excited yet. Watch when I get excited. Okay, so in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and men to have and enjoy fellowship with for eternity. The unthinkable happens and man sins, turns away from God. And so what does God do? God comes and looks for man. Remember the Garden of Eden where God comes in and says, Adam, Adam, where are you? He came and looked at Adam. He looked for Adam and Eve. We see Abel and Cain together. And there was one unfortunate day that Abel, as he was worshiping God, and Cain, observing that act, became jealous because apparently the worship songs that Abel sang were more in with God than the worship that Cain did. And so what happened is that Cain ended up killing Abel. So what does God do? God comes to Cain and says, Cain, where is your brother? We know the story. The story ends with God actually putting a mark on Cain, so that he will not be hurt. Here we have David. David, an artist, a shepherd, a man of valor, a man even of violence. One day, as he had made peace in his kingdom, one day as he was standing on the balcony, wondering what he should do this day, and looking outside over his gardens, right there, the wife of a good friend of his had a nice jacuzzi bath. And David, being David, and being a man, kind of couldn't take his eyes off this lady. We all know what happened with both David and this lady. They sinned. To make things worse, David tried to conceal the matter and killed her husband. So what does God do? God comes in the form of a prophet. 
It says, David, what have you done? Finally, he gets the story of what has taken place. David's wife, or David's not his wife, but David's girlfriend gets pregnant. And the baby dies. And of course, we think, okay, that was God's judgment, the punishment due to the sinful act. That's something that we read in that, but I'm not sure that that is entirely true. We see that God still calls David a man after his own heart. Apparently, God never turned his back on David. Then we have the people of Israel. They were harloting after all kinds of other gods. So what does God do? He sends a prophet again called Hosea and lure the people of Israel back into his fold, trying to convince, listen, this is not the way to live. What do we see? Time and again, the people of Israel turn their back on God, and they continue to harlot themselves after so many other gods and idols. And what does God do? He keeps coming back to them. As a matter of fact, there is a time where God says, listen, if you don't repent, I will repent on your behalf. Because really, when you were a little sibling, I held you in my arms. I fed you with milk. When you were starting to walk, I started to walk with you. And I watched how you took your first steps all by yourself. I cannot let you out of my mind. I constantly think about you. I love you so much. Would you please come back? And if you don't, I'll come to you. And so the story continues. Here we see a woman. She is quite broken. She had five husbands. And the man that she has now is not her husband. So while everybody is having their siesta, she creeps to the place where you can get some water. And she goes there and finds God sitting there. And what does God do? He starts a conversation with her. And he says, you know what? I know your entire life. I know how broken you are. He asks her questions like, are you married? How many husbands? Uh, he prides and he kind of goes on and finally she all spills it out. Because he notices and he spoke it to her. Funnily enough, she is so excited that someone finally found her out that she runs away from the well and preaches as a woman for the first time ever recorded into her village, telling everyone how much God had forgiven her. Because God had told her, I have for you that you will never ever be thirsty again. The water you get from me is everlasting water. You don't have to fill up that hole on the inside emotionally by other men. Let me be the one who can truly fill that up for all eternity. She became the first apostle 
and the first evangelism in her time. Interesting, isn't it? A woman, someone we hardly know the name of, first evangelist, first apostle. Here we have a small man. He is small, but he is quite powerful. He's wealthy as well. He collaborates with the Romans. And the Romans get taxes from their people. And so, one day, as he had filled his pockets once again with the money of his own people that had to pay their taxes to the Romans, and so he kept quite a bit back. And one day as he had his fill of that, he heard that God would come by in town. Now we must understand, this man was very wealthy and yet very poor at the same time because although he had all the money, he had no friends left anymore. So when he heard that God was in town, he thought, maybe he can help me. I don't know. Anyway, when God came in town and he noticed that, he ran to where God would be and climbed into a tree. And as he was sitting in the tree, watching for this man that he had heard so much about, who did miracles and signs and wonders and who spoke so very different than the religious folks of his time. Yes, there he is. And as God came closer, to his great surprise, God looked up right at him, sitting in the tree. And so here he was, Zacchaeus. What did God say? Hey, Zacchaeus. Boy, he knows my name. Zacchaeus, come down, because today I will have some lunch with you. You can imagine his surprise. I mean, being small, having no friends, yet being very wealthy, but not really wanted. It was quite amazing that this man, whom he never had met before, knew one, his name, and secondly, invited him to be having lunch with him. So he climbed out of the tree as fast as his small legs could carry him, ran home, and got a meal prepared. And there God came and sat right across Zacchaeus. And as they were talking together, all of a sudden, Zacchaeus stands up, looks in the eyes of God, and says, you know what? I will pay back all that which I have stolen from my fellow men. And then I will, and I will do that fourfold. And what is left over, I will distribute to the poor. And what does God do? He says, oh, today salvation has come to this house. Here we have a man who's disabled, had never been able to walk from his birth. People told and talked the story that somehow something wrong was in his lineage. So maybe his parents or his grandparents did something wrong and that that was the reason for his lameness. However, this man had four friends who also heard that God was in town. And so they decided to carry this man who could not walk to the meeting where God was. But the meeting was full, too many people around. And so they decided to go up the roof and dig a hole in the roof and let him go down. And so they did. And so here the man is being let down by his four friends. And of course, what happened? God looks up and says, ah, hello, 
You know what? Your sins are forgiven. As soon as he said that, he could hear all the whisperings in people's heads saying, that's blasphemy. How can any man say that someone else's sin is forgiven? That's bad. That could not be God. But God, as humble as he is, he kind of looked up and he said, just so that you know that what I'm saying is absolute truth. And he looked at the man and he said, Hey, why don't you pick up your bed and walk? To the man's surprise, himself. He stood up, picked up his bed, and walked straight out of the meeting. You can imagine what turmoil that caused. Here we have a man that was totally crazy. I mean, he was, he was so crazy that the village did not know what to do with him anymore. So one day, the village council decided to chain him up and to put him outside of the village, somewhere in a deserted place, and that he would just be left to his own device. And so they did. This man was screaming every night hurting himself with stones, rocks, and all kinds of sharp objects, trying to hurt himself. He, he, he was so crazy. People were afraid of him. One day, God decides to take the boat to the other side of the lake. And so he does, as with this intention, to meet this man that everyone is so afraid of. And so... As the man sees God coming from a distance, he cries, Oh, son of David, be merciful on me. To make a long story short, God looked at him as he came closer and he whispered something. Immediately the man was set free. And later on, you could see him sitting down in his right mind, fully clothed. Here we have a woman. And she was caught in the act of sex. Not with her husband, but with someone outside her husband. Adultery. And as it happened, right at that moment, the Pharisees came in, busted in through the door, took her violently, and dragged her right into the middle of the market. I have a feeling that this was all a setup. That this woman was set up. For this particular situation. Why? Because as these religious policemen, so to say, dragged her into the middle of the market, it so happened that God was there. And so, circled around by all this angry mob, and more and more people gathering to see what the commotion was all about. God didn't say a lot. He actually kneeled down and started to write some things in the sand. By the way, that's the only time you see God write something. I wonder what he wrote. But... Whatever he wrote caused those around that had dragged, possibly set up this woman for this situation to all walk away rather inconspicuously, rather quietly. Nobody was left. And so God looks up at the woman who is distraught, crying, and he says, woman, 
Where are your accusers? And the woman says, They're all gone, my Lord. And then God says, Now, you go too. And know what? When you go, sin no more. Now, we as stern evangelicals would say basically what God said was sin no more because if you do I mean maybe once you can be forgiven but when it happens twice well read the gospel story yourself it doesn't say that it doesn't imply that what I believe God actually said to her is Woman, you're free to go. And not only are you free to go, but I've enabled you not to have to do that anymore either. You're free, truly free. Here is a young Dutch man. He's small, like the other guy. And he is experimenting in all kinds of things. Drugs and, and sex and, and all kinds of interesting things. Trying life. The police pick him up because he became so crazy, this young Dutch man, that they thought he becomes a danger for us all. We better lock him up and call his dad. So what does God do? God came in the form of my father, my papa, who told me, Peter, I don't know why you are doing this, but I do want you to know this, that your mother and I are praying for you and that you are forgiven. I went back to my room crying, weeping. What could I do with parents that are so kind, so merciful? However, not long after that, I found myself in a musical, in the Broadway musical Hair. Taking drugs again and going all kinds of weird ways, trying to find an answer in life, trying to connect with the cosmos. So what does God do? He sends two old ladies, 35 years old, to tell Peter about the good news. They even invite him for lunch. And as he comes to lunch with these two people, they end up praying together. And God walks in the life of Peter and changes him completely. Here we have a world gone absolutely mad. Angry, hateful, confused. And they end up crucifying the one who created them. And in the midst of their confusion and in their anger, the one whom they are crucifying says, while they are doing it, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Then, as he dies, on the cross, a horrible death orchestrated not by God, not even by the devil, but by man himself. He gives up his spirit and says, Into thy hand do I commit my spirit. He also says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Did God leave 
his son on the cross all by himself? No. Because it is in Christ that God reconciled this world with him. So where was God the Father at the point of his death on the cross? In Christ. Where was the Holy Spirit? In Christ. And as you read the end of Psalm 22, you'll find out that actually it says, yet you never have forsaken me because you hear the cry of the poor. As we all go that same way of death, what does God do? God actually dies with us. And as He does, He identifies Himself in death. He goes into death with each one, with the entire human race. Not to stay there, but of course, to rise from the dead. And so, as He rises from the dead, so all those that have died will rise as well. And so the story goes on. Man walking away from God. Man trying to flee from Him. And God always pursuing Him. No matter where man goes, God will always find him. I want to do this presentation quickly. Recap what I've just said without many words. Actually, practically no words. But with some music. And Daniel will put it on. And hopefully you will see it and get what this beautiful gospel is all about and how absolutely beautiful it really is.